Major General William Tecumseh Sherman passed the winter of 1865 to 1866 in St. Louis, headquarters of his first post-war command. Seven years earlier, the fortunes of the blunt eccentric had reached new depths in a shabby law office in Leavenworth, Kansas. Only four years earlier, his sanity had been widely questioned. Now, at 46, he was the hero of the Civil War and the already legendary march to the sea, surpassed in popular esteem only by Ulysses S. Grant and the ruler of a military domain sweeping west from the Mississippi River to the crest of the Rocky Mountains and north from Texas to British Canada. The Union's ordeal resolved by four years of bloodletting, the West once more exerted its magnetism on the American imagination. In none did the lure of the frontier kindle more enthusiasm than the restless Sherman. A St. Louis office could not contain him during the summer in which a hundred thousand countrymen, energized, emboldened, and freed from narrow concerns by the war, were expected to push up the Arkansas, the Smoky Hill, the Platte, and the Missouri in search of new opportunities in the West. Early in the season, he made a swing along the eastern margin of the Great Plains. Late in the summer, accompanied by his brother John, U.S. Senator from Ohio, he journeyed up the Platte as far as Fort Laramie, visited Denver, and crossed the Rockies to Fort Garland, then returned down the Smoky Hill River. Everywhere his observations reinforced his conviction that the Army would have a large role to play in the post-war West. When Sherman began his late summer trip in August, the Union Pacific's Eastern Division, later the Kansas Pacific, had reached Manhattan, Kansas, 115 miles from the Missouri, and would be at Fort Riley in another month. Farther north, the general and his brother rode the main line of the Union Pacific from Omaha almost to Fort Kearney, 194 miles before taking ambulances for a journey up the Platte to Fort Laramie. Almost 2,000 miles of plains, mountains, and deserts separated the Missouri from the Pacific. But Sherman's recent comrade in arms, Grenville Dodge, the Union Pacific's chief engineer, gave every evidence of narrowing the gap in record time. While at the California end of the route, Central Pacific labor gangs tore at the summit of the Sierra Nevada. With the wartime volunteers dissipating before the regular army could be recruited and posted, Sherman needed a year or two of peace on the Great Plains. His strategy for 1866 was therefore frankly defensive, aimed only at holding the lines of communication, shepherding the season's immigration safely to the mountains, and averting incidents likely to trigger into open hostility. All I ask is comparative quiet this year, he wrote Grant's chief of staff, for by next year we can have the new cavalry enlisted, equipped, and mounted, ready to go and visit these Indians where they live. General Cook, headquartered at Omaha, was responsible for the most heavily used of the Plains thoroughfares, the Platte Road, the old Oregon California Trail. Guarding its main stem, now teeming with Union Pacific work crews, were Forts Kearney, McPherson, and Sedgwick. At Fort Sedgwick, the road forked, one branch running up the South Platte by Fort Morgan to Denver, the other up the North Platte by Fort Mitchell to Fort Laramie, thence by Forts Casper and Bridger to Utah, Oregon, and California. Also falling within Cook's department was the new road connecting the Platte route with Montana, the Bozeman Trail. Angling northwest from Fort Laramie along the eastern base of the Bighorn Mountains to Bozeman and Virginia City offered travelers the shortest route to the Montana gold fields. At the forks of the Powder River stood Fort Reno, a reminder of the Army's failure to crush the Sioux opposition to the road and a platform for future attempts to extend military protection to it. A series of treaties with all the warring tribes in the autumn of 1865 had restored peace. In the south, Kiowas, Comanches, Kiowa Apaches, Cheyennes, and Arapahoes had agreed to withdraw to the territory south of Kansas and east of New Mexico. In the north, all seven tribes of the Teton Sioux, Ogallala, Hunkpapa, Minaconju, Brule, Two Kettle, Blackfeet, and Sans Arc, together with the upper and lower Yangtane Sioux, had agreed to leave the warpath and, quote, withdraw from the roots over land already established or hereafter to be established through their country. Officials of the Indian Bureau were sure that this comprehensive set of treaties would bring lasting peace to the Great Plains, but the chiefs who signed the treaties did not always fully represent all the bands of the tribes thus bound. 
nor did the chiefs always understand everything that they agreed to. Nor, in a highly democratic and individualistic tribal society, were they always able to make their people comply with the engagements, especially when the customs of generations were surrendered. Nor did they always see good reason for keeping promises. On the Northern Plains, the chiefs who signed could only claim to represent no more than a few friendly bands along the Missouri River, a fact the peace commissioners concealed, if indeed they even knew. Farther west, in the Powder River country, the warriors who had confounded General Patrick E. Connors' heavy columns the previous summer subscribed to no such sweeping concession as withdrawal from any road hereafter to be established. They had just fought a war to prevent the opening of the Bozeman Trail. Moreover, like their friends in the south, the southern Ogallalas and the southern Brulees were accustomed to hunt on the south side of the Great Platte Road. Finally, again like their southern friends, Many Indians in the northern tribes had succumbed to the lure of the treasure to be obtained through barter or theft along the white man's roads. Tacitly acknowledging the softness of their 1865 treaties, the peace commissioners went back up the Missouri in 1866 to find some more chiefs to sign. Other commissioners journeyed to Fort Laramie on the same mission. A veteran of many years of frontier duty and also an outspoken critic on the treaty system, General Pope had no illusions about the lasting peace. I do not consider the treaties lately made with the Sioux, Cheyennes, Arapahoes, and Comanches worth the paper they were written on, he informed Sherman on August 11, 1866. I have myself no doubt that the hostilities will again break out on the Platte, the Smoke Hill, the Arkansas Rivers, before the beginning of winter. At this very time as Sherman was traveling up the Platte, Hostilities had already broken out with the Sioux north of the Platte. Even at Fort Laramie, the edge of the zone of hostilities, the full magnitude of the war did not register with Sherman. In truth, the Teton Sioux not only had no intention of withdrawing from the Bozeman Trail to Montana, they had no intention of allowing anyone to use it. To hear the Sioux tell it, life was good on the high plains of the Dakotas before the white man came. The Teton Sioux wandered in leisurely, light-hearted fashion wherever the wind moved them. Buffalo moved in dark masses on the grasslands. Black Hills and the Rockies were populous with deer, beaver, and bear, and other game. The Sioux were great hunters, but starvation was usually far from their teepees. They were great warriors, and near at hand were their traditional enemies, crows, pawnees, flatheads, Shoshones, and Blackfeet who were so necessary for them, for who else should the Sioux Braves win honor from? The skill of the squaws provided every necessity. The world was full of pleasant valleys. Wahan Tonka, the great mystery, smiled on his children. In an Ogallala teepee, about 1822, was born a baby boy. His father had no particular distinction except that he died a drunkard. What the boy, Red Cloud, made of himself was due to his own personal traits, not to any family influence. There has never been a satisfactory explanation of how he got his name, but no matter, he made it notable in history. His early years were typical of boys of his tribe. He became a skillful hunter, a magnificent horseman, and he could hold his own with any in feats of skill, speed, strength, and agility. Very early he gained fame as a warrior and leader, even in his early 20s, he had his following. The Teton Sioux loved fighting. Their five great tribes, the Ogallalas, Unkpapas, Sanzarks, Brules, Minakanjus, joined with the two Yangtai bands, had frequent war parties in the field. Red Cloud had plenty of chances to distinguish himself. The warriors looked upon war as a way to win honor. There was always greater rivalry to do some deed of stark daring than merely to inflict damage upon the enemy. Some of their exploits seemed quixotic to our modern standards. The brave who charged into battle and struck his armed, unwounded enemy with his coup stick, or open hand, received more distinction for it than did the man who killed and scalped his enemy. The man who stole into a hostile camp and crept out leading a single horse, whose lariat he had cut among the teepees, was applauded more than the man who ran off a whole herd of ponies outside of the village. Instead of a definite military division, such as regiments, companies, and squads, each with its appropriate officers, the Sioux fighting units were based on the prestige of various chiefs. Renowned Sioux leaders had big bands of warriors, 
Each of these bands operated separately and retained the characteristics of an autonomous nation. It levied its own wars, moved to suit itself, and was generally independent. Occasionally, two or three bands would combine in a grand war party, but the idea of amassing three or four thousand fighting men in the field and keeping them in it for months at a time was yet to come. Living in an atmosphere of constant action, few of the Sioux noticed the dark cloud heavy with portent, which loomed on the horizon. The white man was beginning to steep across the plains in a strange stampede over the mountains, was beginning to wander among the hills grubbing in the dirt, spoiling the little springs for the dull yellow metal it prized above food, drink, and above the love of his women. There had been a war for some time in the south. The settlers in Kansas resented the presence of the Cheyennes and the Kiowas on their frontier. The Indians were angered by the constant streams of immigrants who moved down the Santa Fe and Platte River trails on their way to California and Oregon. The caravans of covered wagons made much noise. What with creaking wheels, the shouts of mule skinners and cracking of whips, the bellowing of cattle and the general hubbub which always accompany the white man wherever he goes. As a result, the buffalo and antelope moved out of the country. It was ruined as a hunting ground. The Indians made more than one attack on these wagon trains, and the white man in revenge fired upon the next band they met, often killing the Indians, who knew nothing of any former attack and who approached them with the friendliest intentions. This aroused still deeper enmity among the Indians, and the vicious circle continued until all western Kansas and Colorado were in a state of warfare. In the summer of 1857, Colonel E.V. Sumner campaigned against the Cheyennes. There were several clashes with troops in later years, and in the morning of November 29, 1864, Colonel J.M. Chivington, with a regiment of a hundred days men, led the notorious Sand Creek Massacre, in which he destroyed the Cheyenne villages of Black Kettle and White Antelope. The Cheyennes carried the war pipe to the Sioux, and Sitting Bull and other chiefs smoked it with them, but Red Cloud was already definitely on the warpath. Streaming westward, harried out of Minnesota, had come the Sante Sioux by the hundreds, telling of Little Crow's war and the causes of it. Red Cloud and the Tetons heard and sympathized. When in the summer of 1865, Major General G.M. Dodge, commanding the Department of the Missouri, sent four columns of troops up the Missouri to further punish the Cheyenne, the Teton Sioux joined their relatives in the war. Red Cloud rode and skirmished with soldiers under General Sully, Connor, Cole, and Walker. He joined the Cheyennes in an attack upon Colonel Sawyer's military train which was marching up the Neobrara River to open a wagon train to the Montana gold fields. The fight was inconclusive. Sawyer paid Red Cloud an indemnity of a wagon load of sugar, coffee, and rice on his promise to withdraw. The chief was true to his promise, but some other Sioux came up and had not shared in the provisions, and the soldiers had to fight in spite of the indemnity. The Harney-Sanborn Treaty was signed in 1865. Spotted Tail, man afraid of his horses, and other chiefs conceded the white man a safe passage through their lands. Red Cloud was not present. He was in his teepee, critically wounded by a crow arrow. Shortly before, on a raid against the crows, an arrow fired from ambush had struck him squarely in the middle of the back and passed completely through so that its barbed head struck out from his breast. He was carried out of danger, and a medicine man had tried to draw out the arrow. The feather at the back and the barbs in front prevented the shaft from being withdrawn. At length, the medicine man had cut off the head, after which the arrow was drawn out. By a miracle, no vital organs were pierced, and Red Cloud eventually recovered. He was set against allowing the provisions of the Harney Sanborn Treaty to be carried out. Far more sighted than his fellows, he saw the inevitable disaster to his country if ever the white man were allowed to set foot firmly in it. With Red Cloud urging them on, the turbulent young warriors of the Sioux kept up a series of depredations which at length forced the government to send out a second treaty commission in the spring of 1866 to offer the Sioux new terms. The Great Council was held at Fort Laramie. Red Cloud was present. He was now the foremost warrior of his tribe, and his influence was steadily thrown against the white man's proposal. While the council was in session, a column of troops led by General Henry B. Carrington rode up. They were on their way to the Powder River country, in defiance of the very spirit of the peace council, to erect a row of forts and apparently did not even know the council was in session. Carrington rode up, 
dismounted, and was being introduced to the members of the commission when Red Cloud dramatically leapt upon the platform under the shade of the pine boughs, pointed to Carrington's colonel's shoulder straps, and shouted that he was White Eagle, who had come to steal the road through the Indian's land. The dramatic suddenness of the gesture riveted the attention of the Indians. Then he turned, and followed by every eye, sprang from the platform, ordered his teepee struck, and led his band out on the prairie, openly announcing that he was going on the warpath. That broke up the council. For some days, the older chiefs of the other Sioux bands remained sullenly in conclave, but their young men were melting away like snow in the summer to join the standard raised in such a spectacular manner by Red Cloud. Finally, in sheer self-defense to protect their own prestige, the older chiefs followed. Red Cloud was the greatest figure in the Sioux peoples. He had made the Sioux come to him. Now, they looked to him for orders. In the meantime, Carrington marched into the Powder River country, looking for a spot to erect a fort. The government wanted a string of posts built to protect the Bozeman Trail, over which thousands of immigrants were ready to travel to the new gold districts of Idaho and Montana. Carrington found an ideal location on the banks of Piney Creek, a branch of the Powder River, and began construction of Fort Phil Kearney. Later, a second post known as Fort C.F. Smith was built 91 miles away to the north. Carrington was a lawyer by training and reorganized the Ohio State Militia upon the outbreak of the Civil War. During the war, he helped save West Virginia for the Union by sending the Ohio Militia there. He also served as Chief Mustering Officer for Indiana. He was an administrator, and had never experienced a single day of combat. He chose his post out west in order to further his post-war career in the military. Red Cloud smoked with many chiefs and tribes in those days. He was the prime mover in the hostilities against the white man, but there were many who saw eye to eye with him on the matter. Crazy Horse, the young paladin of the Ogallalas, was one. There was Black Shield, and High Backbone of the Minikanjus, the mystical shaman, Sitting Bull, and the famed dog soldier of the Cheyennes, Roman Nose, who were just as eager as he to fight. This land in the west, the Powder River Country, the last good hunting ground as the Sioux called it, was recently wrested by the Sioux from their enemies, the Crow, Shoshone, and Blackfoot. Beginning in 1851, the Sioux had pushed west and had only just subdued chiefly the Crow tribe and claiming this new land for their expanding empire. Not twenty years removed from being invaders themselves, the Sioux gathered in a magnificent response to Red Cloud's call. At times, their huge encampment extended for miles up and down Little Goose River. Estimates of as high as 15,000 Indians were made of this camp with upward of 4,000 fighting men. This number is probably too high. But even so, it was the most imposing fighting force the Sioux had ever put into the field. No finer natural cavalry ever existed than the Sioux, according to such authorities as General George Crook and General Frederick Benteen. Yet they were unfitted for conducting a sustainable siege. Their ideas of organization were the most rudimentary. In spite of this, the Sioux, largely because of the leadership of Red Cloud, besieged Fort Phil Kearney for more than two years. There are writers who have denied that Red Cloud played the dominating role ascribed to him in the campaign. It is true that the Indians are prone to exaggerate not only their own importance but that of the leaders of their individual bands, so that it is often difficult to discover who was the actual commander in a given encounter. Still, the impression of Red Cloud's importance and that of the part he played is too well established to be dismissed from history. General Carrington began building the fort on July 15th. Less than 48 hours later, at daybreak on the 17th, the Indians made their first attack. Part of the post horses were stampeded, and in a brisk little fight, two soldiers were killed and three wounded. Later that day, the same war party scooped up the outfit of Louis Gazos, a traveling settler, and killed six men. In the next 12 days, five wagon trains were attacked, 15 men killed, and much of the livestock run off. On July 14th, Carrington wrote for reinforcements, he already knew the implacability of his enemy. The Sioux did not formally invest the fort, but they planted scouting parties everywhere about it. The soldiers found they had a foe who never slept. Did a herder stray from his guard? He was cut off and killed. Did a sentry expose himself on the palisade during the moonlit night? A bullet from a bush laid him low. Did a detachment of soldiers set out without an imposing display of power? 
they straight away had to fight for their very existence. Even during the long, bitter cold spells, the Indians kept the circle of death about the post. That was not like the Sioux, whose custom was to withdraw to their camps during the cold weather. Better than anything else, that showed the grim purpose of their leader. There was an atmosphere of constant dread about the fort, reflected in the letters of the soldiers who wrote home, and the feeling was justified by the circumstances. In the first six months, from August 1st to December 31st, the Sioux killed 154 persons at or near Fort Phil Kearney, wounded 20 more, and captured nearly 700 head of livestock. 51 times they made hostile demonstrations. It was a hectic existence for the garrison. In spite of this constant pressure, the men worked on building the fort with dogged courage. The country about was hilly, but barren, and the nearest forest from which the stockade post would be obtained were seven miles away. An enormous mount of wood was required for the huge rectangular palisade, 1,600 feet long by 600 feet wide, to say nothing of the corral for several hundred horses and mules, and 42 buildings in the post. Large parties of men continuously felled timber and hauled it to the fort. At times, this wood train numbered 150 members. All through these six months, not a man left the stockade without knowing that he might never see it again. They worked with the rifles close at hand, and a guard stood constantly under arms. Even so, men were frequently cut off and killed. Sometimes soldiers disappeared, and no trace of them was ever found. That meant one thing, they had been captured and carried away for torture. In his book recounting his encounters with the Sioux, Colonel Richard I. Dodge wrote, A favorite method of torture was to stake out the victim. He was stripped of his clothing, laid on his back on the ground, and his arms and legs were stretched to the utmost. In this state, he was not only helpless, but almost motionless. All this time, the Indians pleasantly talked to him. It was all a kind of a joke. Then a small fire was built near one of his feet. When that was so cooked as to have little sensation, another fire was built near the other foot. Then the legs and arms and body until the whole person was crisped. Finally, a small fire was built on the naked breast and kept up until the life was extinct. Captain William J. Fetterman was a soldier by birth, instinct, and profession. He had seen the elephant in the Civil War and led men onto the battlefield. A veteran of General Sherman's march to the sea, Fetterman served with great distinction, rising through the ranks to acting assistant adjutant general of nine regiments, more than 10,000 men and was ultimately breveted lieutenant colonel for, quote, great gallantry and good conduct, unquote. Four years of increasing responsibility shaped Fetterman into a seasoned and well-respected military officer. The Army reorganization that was scheduled to go into effect on January 1st, 1867, would have Fetterman assuming the command of a newly formed 27th Infantry Regiment, based at Fort Phil Kearney and would move Carrington and his 18th Regiment to a fort further south on the Bozeman Trail. From the first, he disapproved of Carrington's tactics. Fetterman arrived in November. On December 6th, he had a chance at the action he craved, and an opportunity to test the mettle of his tawny foe. On that day, frantic signaling from the lookout on the near-looming Pilot Hill showed that the wood train was attacked two miles from the fort and forced to corral. Fetterman with 40 men, including Lieutenants Grummond, Bingham and Wands, and Captain Fred H. Brown dashed to the rescue, while Carrington and 25 troopers rode over the Piney to take Indians in the rear. Down the valley galloped the eager Fetterman, dust rose ahead, and they saw horsemen, Sioux. Guns began to speak, and bullets kicked up little clouds of dirt around the horses' feet, but Fetterman's carbines were crackling too. The Sioux whipped their horses and rode hard down the valley. Fetterman chased them for five miles, his men shooting about, not hitting any of the Indians. The wood train made its way onto the fort unmolested. Thus far, the affair was fun. The pursuit turned to spur at the Sullivan Hills, and the fort was shut out of view. In a twinkling, the whole aspect of things changed. The Sioux stopped running. Other mounted warriors joined them, and now yelping and shooting, they turned and charged. At the Indian rush, some of Fetterman's troops whirled their horses and spurred as hard as they could for safety. He had only about 25 men left, and the Sioux outnumbered him four to one, but he held his ground. It looked as if it would be hand-to-hand -hand in a minute, when there was a clatter of hoofs, and Carrington, his saber flashing, galloped around the spur at the head of his detachment. Not knowing how many soldiers were following Carrington, the Sioux rode off. Fetterman was saved. But for the timely arrival of the post commander, it would have been all over. As it was, Lieutenant Bingham and Sergeant Rogers were dead. 
Lieutenant Grummond barely escaped with his life from the circle of barbaric foes. Five other soldiers were wounded. It was a clever ambuscade and almost worked. The plan was a favorite one with the Sioux and Cheyennes, a small decoy party to lead the foe into reach of the main body of warriors. In this case, Indian lookouts were observed on the hills signaling the troops' movements. Red Cloud's plans miscarried, but were later put into good effect. According to many modern accounts, Fetterman made his infamous boast shortly after the skirmish. Quote, With 80 men, I could ride through the whole Sioux Nation. Unquote. In fact, this statement does not appear anywhere prior to 1904, 38 years after it was allegedly uttered. The boast Fetterman likely did make in 1866, as recorded by both Margaret and Francis Carrington, carries no ironic power. And after the captain actually did engage the Indians in the fight on December 6th, he came to Carrington and timidly informed his commander that he had, quote, learned a lesson and that this Indian war has become a hand-to-hand -hand fight requiring the utmost caution, unquote. Two weeks passed. The morning of Friday, December 21st, dawned bright and cheery, the sun gleaming on the snow in the hills. Carrington surveyed the almost completed fort with a creator's pride. One more consignment of logs, he estimated, would finish the hospital building, the last structure to be built. That morning, a wood train of 55 men started to the hills. At 11 o'clock, the Pilot Hill lookout began violently signaling the wood train had been attacked. Boots and saddles, sounded the bugles. Carrington quickly told off 49 men from the 18th Infantry and 27 men from the 2nd Cavalry for relief. He ordered Captain James Powell, experienced and cool-headed, to take command. But Fetterman came up and begged so hard for the assignment, urging his seniority, that the general gave in. Lieutenant Grummond volunteered to lead the cavalry. Captain Brown, soon to be transferred to Fort Laramie, asked to go along. A couple of old Indian fighters, Wheatley and Fisher, likewise went with their new Henry breech-loading rifles, which they, quote, wanted to try on the Redskins. Every man was mounted, including the infantry, and they carried Spencer carbines and revolvers, or Springfield muskets. Ammunition was low, so they were not very well supplied. Still, they looked formidable enough as they rode out of the fort, 81 officers and men. Carrington gave Fetterman specific orders. Relieve the wood train, drive back the Indians, but on no account pursue the Indians beyond Lodge Trail Ridge. To make sure he was not misunderstood, he repeated the orders to Grummond. Instead of heading south of the Sullivan Hills, where he heard the firing, Fetterman rode north of the hills toward Lodge Trail Ridge, which he occupied with his men in skirmish order shortly after noon. As he did so, the lookout signaled that the wood train was no longer being attacked. Now an alarming thing happened. Fetterman's command, after a brief halt on the ridge, disappeared on the other side. He had deliberately disobeyed orders. Fetterman perhaps merited all the censure that has been heaped on his head for that disobedience, but a wiser man than he might have fallen victim to the uncanny skill of a trap which was prepared for him. As he mounted the ridge, he saw a handful of Indians below him, riding so daringly near that the hot impulse to pursue could not be denied. How was he to know that in the ravines running on each side of the draw, hid Sioux and Cheyennes in the hundreds, their mounted men clustered at the mouth of the ravine to close the door of the trap, while others in scores lay in the grass across the line of march. The handful of warriors who so tantalized Fetterman were ten hand-picked men, chosen as a high honor for this tremendously dangerous post. One of them was the famous Big Nose, brother of the great Cheyenne chief, Little Wolf. As the soldiers started after the audacious decoys, Big Nose, greatly daring, whipped his horse back and forth in front of the troops. So close he seemed to be right among them, yet escaped from the hail of bullets unscathed. At last the ten Indians divided into two groups, riding apart, then crisscrossing. It was the signal to close in. A wild whooping, a rush, and the Cheyennes charged. When the whole mass of Indians swept around the little band of soldiers, some rode clear through the blue line. The troops grew rattled. Fetterman, Brown, and the infantry stopped and became separated from Grumman's cavalry. These men died in the first fierce rush of savages, stabbed and clubbed to death as they stood. But Grumman gathered his troops around him on the ridge, surrounded by the yelling horde. Arrows glinted like a swarm of grasshoppers flashing across the sky. Suddenly, according to the Indian account, the officer commanding the cavalry, Grumman, went down, shot or beaten out of his saddle. The troops grew panicky. Remorselessly, the Indians followed them as they tried to retreat up the ridge, 
There was a final great rush, a desperate smother of flashing lances, tomahawks and clubs, then all was quiet, except for the whooping of the victors. Fetterman's command was dead to a man. Back at the fort, Carrington, noting with alarm that Fetterman had disobeyed orders, looked around for somebody to send after him. Five minutes after the command disappeared, heavy firing broke out. The roar of many guns was continuous and increased in volume. Everyone knew that a hard battle was in progress. Surgeon Hines was sent with an orderly with instructions to join Fetterman if possible. Hines quickly returned. There were too many Indians in the hills. At that, Carrington ordered Captain R-10 Ike with every man who could be spared to follow Fetterman. Followed by 54 soldiers, the captain galloped down the trail and began to ascend the ridge. It was noticed that the firing was diminished in volume. What happened? Were the Indians driven off? Or were the soldiers beaten? Carrington was nearly crazed with anxiety. He knew the men were ill-supplied with ammunition. Then, just before Ten Eyck reached the summit with three or four scattered shots, the firing abruptly ceased altogether. Ten Eyck in turn disappeared beyond the ridge. In a few minutes, an orderly came spurring down the hill at a dead run. He rode into the fort with a message which filled every listener with dread. The valley on either side of the ridge is filled with Indians who are threatening me, wrote Ten Eyck. The firing was stopped. No sign of Fetterman's command. Send the howitzer. Back went the orderly with word that reinforcements were coming. Forty men followed hard at his heels. At the same time, Carrington armed every non-combatant man at the post, even released prisoners from a guardhouse to man the palisades. No howitzer could be sent for lack of horses. When Ten Eyck crossed the ridge, more than 2,000 Indians were in the valley, he estimated, dashing back and forth, yelling, their war bonnets flying in the breeze. It was cold. The temperature was falling, presaging the blizzard soon to come. Ten Eyck did not descend the hill until reinforcements arrived. By that time, the Indians were gone. Cautiously, Ten Eyck moved down the road. Quite without warning, he came upon the ghastly evidence of the terrible disaster. In a little space enclosed by huge rocks were the bodies of Fetterman, Brown, and 47 of their men. This was where the infantry had been overwhelmed. It was a horrible sight. The bodies of the dead were stripped, scalped, shot full of arrows, and mutilated. Years afterwards, the Sioux showed a rough, knotty war club of burr oak, driven full of nails and spikes, which had been used to beat the soldiers' brains out. It was still covered with brains and hair, glued to it in clotted blood. Fetterman and Brown had bullet holes in their left temples from weapons held so close that the powder had burned their faces. They had saved their last shots for themselves to escape capture and torture. Ten Eyck brought the 49 corpses to the fort in wagons, it was now bitter cold and night was setting in. With darkness, preparations were made to resist the expected Indian attack. Double guards were placed in every barrack. A non-commissioned officer and two men stood watch. The surviving officers did not sleep, but the night passed without attack. Morning dawned, cold and blustery with the blizzard threatening. Carrington, disregarding the advice of his officers, took 80 men and went to learn the fate of Grummond and the 32 missing men. As he left, he ordered every woman and child placed in the magazine with an officer sworn not to allow a single one to fall into the Indian's hands alive. If the Indians captured the fort, he was to blow up the magazine. Evidences of the fight multiplied as Carrington reached the fatal ridge. Dead cavalry horses were scattered along the trail. Here and there, they found the bodies of slaughtered soldiers. A quarter of a mile beyond the scene of the greatest carnage lay Grummond. Still farther were the corpses of the dozen men, grouped together with many empty cartridge shells about them. To one side were the dead frontiersmen, Wheatley and Fisher, with a heap of empty shells as evidence that they had sold their lives dearly. Within a few hundred feet of this position were found ten ponies and sixty-five great gouts of blood which had flowed from the death wounds of so many Indians. No ponies and no death spots were found anywhere else. All of the bodies were scalped and mutilated. Every man was now accounted for. Eighty-one were dead. After the peace treaty, the Indians admitted twelve killed and about sixty wounded on their side. But years later, the Cheyennes said that the dead warriors laid out side by side made two long rows, perhaps fifty or sixty men. There is scarcely a doubt that each of the sixty-five blood spots on the field meant a dead Indian. 
Wounded Indians leave a battlefield with wonderful celerity, and one who cannot move until he was bled freely may safely be counted as dead or mortally wounded. There has been much dispute as to who led the Indians in this battle. Red Cloud said he commanded. High Backbone, the Minikanju, has also been named, as have Black Leg and Black Shield. But it is probable that the real commander of the Indians was Crazy Horse, who was just beginning to build his reputation as the greatest fighter the Sioux ever produced. Carrington brought the dead back to the fort. That night, the threatening sky fulfilled its portent. A terrific blizzard broke loose. The thermometer fell to 30 degrees below zero. Snow piled up so rapidly against the stockade that details of men had to work constantly to shovel it away, lest it pile high enough to allow the Indians to climb over. Sentries could stand the intense cold only 20 minutes at a time. Even with the quick reliefs, there were many frozen feet, ears, noses, and fingers. But for the blizzard, the Indians might have followed their advantage by attacking the fort itself. According to their own account, this was part of the plan. To the people at the fort, the arrival of cold weather was providential. Southward, 236 miles away, lay Fort Laramie with reinforcements, ammunition, and supplies. Word must be gotten through. There was no telegraph, so a courier had to take it. Carrington called for volunteers. Several of the old plainsmen were in the post, and many veteran soldiers, but they shook their heads. That ride, over a broken, snow-covered country, even in times of peace, meant almost certain death by freezing. With the temperature where it was, and the blizzard raging so, it was hard to see a hundred yards ahead. With the country swarming with hostile Indians, it was odds of a hundred to one against any man rash enough to attempt it. But there was one man willing to take the risk. John Phillips, commonly known as Portuguese, was an Indian fighter, trapper, and scout. He knew the country and offered to go. Portuguese Phillips was moved by sorrow for the widow of old Lieutenant Grummond, a young woman freshly out from the east, and perhaps a tenderer emotion. Carrington gave him his own horse, a blooded Kentucky runner, the swiftest animal in the post. Wrapping himself in a huge buffalo coat with a little hardtack for himself and a sack of grain for his horse, he passed out through the side gate into the whirling storm. Nobody ever got the full details of that ride, but it will always remain one of the epics of the West. At first he walked into the blackness of the night storm. For hours he led his horse, stopping at suspicious noises. He expected to be seen in the first half mile, but no Indian yelled. With the howling wind whipping the snow around him, he mounted at last and spurred his horse along across the piney and passed frozen Lake Dismet. Behind him, the lights of the fort grew dim and disappeared. On through the storm plunged Portuguese Phillips. The miles fell behind him like the snow he shook from his furry shoulders. The Indians were in their teepees, not dreaming that any white man would face the fury of this storm, and Portuguese Phillips rode on. Day dawned and still the wind whirled the snow. A short stop to feed his horse and cram a few crackers down his own throat, a handful of snow for a drink, and Portuguese Phillips was in the saddle again. How he guided his horse across the wilderness is explained only by the instinct which is sometimes possessed by those perfectly attuned to the wilds. From the Bighorn Mountains, the blizzard swept with unslacking fury, piling in drifts from five to 25 feet deep. The storm prevented his seeing any landmarks, Yet on he rode, as unerring as a hound on a slot. Night fell, and still the good steed breasted the snow. Just at dawn, he reached Horseshoe Station, 40 miles from Laramie. He telegraphed his news to Fort Laramie. Fortunately, he did not trust the telegraph. The message never got through. After a brief rest, he rode on. It was Christmas Eve, and they were holding high revel at Fort Laramie. A grand ball was in progress at the officers' club. Beautiful women, garbed in silks and satins, and gallant officers in brilliant dress uniforms made the interior a splendid kaleidoscope of changing color. The sound of violins, the laughter of ladies, and the banter of the men who were taking holiday from military cares created a symphony of cheery sound. Above this happy noise came the sharp challenge of the sentry. It was followed by the shouting of men in the fort enclosure and a rush of running steps outside, coupled with a ringing call for the officer of the day. The dancing stopped. Officers and ladies grouped themselves at doors and windows, gazing out at the snow-covered parade ground. A horse lay there, gasping its last, fallen from exhaustion, and reeling, swaying like a drunkard, a gigantic fur-clad figure staggered toward the hall. In through the door he stumbled and stood for a moment, supporting himself on the lintel while his eyes blinked in the unaccustomed light. Then, 
Seeing the post commander, he told the story of the Fetterman disaster, which abruptly ended the festivities that night. As he gasped out his story and appealed for reinforcements, he swayed, then fell crashing to the floor, unconscious from exposure and exhaustion. Kind hands lifted him and carried him to bed. Even with his rugged physique, it took him weeks to recover from the terrible ordeal. To this day, his ride remains unparalleled in American history. <laughs>